Uh, today, I, I've made a change in terms of the, the class schedule because last week I didn't finish everything I wanted to do on Science and Origins 1, come in Lindy, um, and then some people had been saying as we went along that uh, in, in addition to just responding to the New Atheist, which is the title of this class, I mean it's response to the New Atheism, um, to do some kind of proactive stuff of explaining why we believe what we believe. And so I'm going to do some of that today as part of what I'm calling Science and Origins 2. Last week we talked about uh, Darwinism. And I want to, I'm going to spend the first 10 or 15 minutes today kind of uh, reestablishing some of what I talked about last week as a foundation for where we're going with this. It never hurts us to hear things more than once. One of my seminary professor said he thought the most important professorship in any university or seminary should be the chair of the repetitious and redundant because most of the stuff we need to know we've probably heard before but we've forgotten it so we need to have it repeated for us. So um, today we are dealing with uh, um, Science and Origins 2. Next week we're going to look at morality, suffering, and violence because one of the claims of the New Atheists is that uh, Christianity especially, but all religion is responsible for all of the violence in the world. So next week we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about morality in the sense that this is one of the biggest challenges, as I've said before, that the, the any atheist, but especially the new, new atheist face, is to explain from where do we get a sense of the moral if we don't have uh, any external kind of forces that are providing that for us, if it truly is entirely a naturalistic world that there is nothing but the physical universe, there is nothing beyond the, the atoms that are around us, then from where does a sense of the moral come? And we'll talk about that next week, in addition to addressing specifically where, um, where morality comes from and what the argument has been in that regard. I am going to make every effort, and that's as far as I want to go in terms of making a commitment, I will make every effort to have for you next week our uh, what you need to know from the apologetics class so that you can... Study that, whether you are taking the test or not, that will give you a summary of the things I think you need to know from this class. If you are taking the test, which will have to be on November 20th, then it will be everything you need to know will be on that, that paper. So um, you can be ready for that. And then November 13th, I'm sort of going to sort of turn it around to talk about the influence of religion, the positive advantages, although they claim all bad things come from religion. The fact that it was... Christianity invented orphanages, we invented hospitals, we invented, you know, care for um, the, the indigent. Somebody once said, really? They were doing that before Christianity came along. Prior to Christianity, those things occurred, but they occurred only for a given group. For instance, the Jews had free schools, but only for Jewish kids. Um, Christianity was the, in Europe was the first one to actually begin to offer those kind of services, even to people who didn't agree with you. And so we'll talk about that, the influence that religion has had in a larger scale, not just spiritually, but in a larger sense. Um, okay, as I said, I'm going to re restate, recapture some of the things we talked about last week in order to give us a foundation for some of what we're going into. Uh, so I'm starting out with the status of Darwinism and naturalism in the world today and what that means and some of the, some of the things they claim which we have reason, very serious reason to question. And then I'll talk about some of the arguments from the positive side, why we believe that there is a God and why he is the creator and why we believe life came from a source beyond the material world. This we talked about last week. Belief in Darwinism is as a comprehensive explanation for the biosphere, that is for the world, the world that sustains life. That has become a major deterrent for the Christian faith. Almost all of the people who insist today that they are atheists, they do not believe in God, they do so because of the reassurance they have from Darwinism, that Darwinism, that is uh, descent with modification, natural selection, as we talk about it, that explains everything that needs to be explained about the existence of life, and in fact, that all of the world as we know it, the universe and this planet, as well as the life that exists on it, all can be explained from a naturalism kind of point of view, a naturalistic point of view. Naturalism or materialism, very close to the same thing. Um, there's a slight difference in definition, but for all intents and purposes, they are interchangeable. Means that the material world, the natural physical world is all that exists. There is nothing beyond that. There is no soul, there is no God, there are no angels, there is no spiritual beings at all. There is nothing supernatural. That's why it is called naturalism. 
Well, the establishment of naturalism as being the assumed policy of science has led to more and more people with a scientific background accepting the fact that there is nothing supernatural, therefore there is no God. Darwinism, uh, speaking of the new atheists, Richard Dawkins, the most probably vehement and the most visible of the new atheists, said that as a young man, he, he, gave, he went away from any religious belief once he discovered Darwinism. Darwinism presents itself as having all of the answers, and so much so that it prevents really further discussion than that. They do not countenance any disagreement with that. They claim that uh, anything that is not in advocating Darwinism and a purely naturalistic explanation for the, the world and for life is entirely religious, it's nonsensical, it's not worth, worthy of discussion. In fact, um, Stephen Jay Gould once told Richard Dawkins, Stephen Jay Gould was a, a prominent scientist, uh, he's, he's no longer alive, he said that he would not debate with creationists of any kind um, because that gave them the oxygen of respectability, which is all they really craved. They didn't care if they won or not, they just wanted the credibility uh, of, of being involved in debates with significant people. Now, the reality is, as I think if you were here last week, you got a little bit of, and I'm going to talk about some today, Darwinism actually suffers from some very serious, even fatal flaws, both logically and evidentially. It simply does not hold together, I don't believe, and I'm not the only one, as I'll mention in a minute. It is far less well supported than is commonly thought. It was not, it was not universal in its support in Darwin's day, it is not today. And yet, we need to know something about why we believe that's true. Again, Darwinism rejects all criticisms of Darwinism as being religiously based, unscientific, and unworthy of serious attention. They claim that any, critique, any, any criticism or critique of Darwinism must have religion as its foundation. But the fact is that a great many thinkers, including significant scientists today, are questioning whether or not Darwinism works, whether it makes sense, whether you can defend it as being the correct answer for where life came from. Since 2001, over 900 scientists of various worldviews, not for religious reasons, for scientific reasons, now some of them may be religious, but that's not why they did this, have signed a published statement which questions the legitimacy of Darwinism. The said statement that they have signed is this. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection, that's the definition of Darwinism, to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Over 900 scientists have signed that statement. And these aren't just all religious people. In fact, most of them are not religious people. If you'd like to read more about that, you can go to their website, which is descentfromdarwin.org. D-I-S-S-E-N-T-F-R-O-M-D-A-R-W-I-N.org, descentfromdarwin.org. And um, I, I read the, a longer statement about it last week, but you need to recognize that there are a lot of scientists who are saying Darwinism simply doesn't hold together. It's not just us religious nuts, to, to quote Richard Dawkins, who would say that Darwinism isn't true. Now, last week I gave you a bunch of different examples, what are sometimes called the icons of evolution. The arguments that the evolutionary biologist, the Darwinian biologist, will claim prove their point. And I'm going to go over these very quickly again this week because a number of you weren't here last week and again this will kind of give us a foundation for where we want to go the, the rest of today. One of the sort of uh, poster children of the insect world for Darwinian evolution are the peppered moths that exist in Britain. The claim has been made that when pollution, because of the Industrial Revolution, caused the tree trunks around, especially Manchester, England, to be darkened by soot, then there was a natural selection process whereby the light-colored moths that landed on these trees were more visible to birds, and so they all got eaten. The dark-colored moths were harder to see, and so they reproduced, and the dark-colored moths um, became the dominant, and they said that's, a, that's an example of microevolution, of the fact that, that the particular characteristic of dark colored moths that allowed them to survive, survival of the fittest, made them the dominant. Well, the fact is that that doesn't hold. 
up until the 1980s. And I can remember the textbook, a science textbook I had in high school, where they had a picture of the moths on the tree, right? Um, and the problem is, since the 1980s, darker moths have not replaced lighter moths in other parts of England where the pollution was even worse. So that has not held. The converse of that, that in places where the, evolution, where the um, pollution has receded and the trees have turned lighter again, some of those places there are still more dark colored moths. And you would think that that would have changed and there would now be more light colored moths. And there are places in, in London where as pollution has decreased, there's throughout the whole city, in some places there are more dark, dark colored moths, in some places there are more light colored moths. The, the fact is, it doesn't line up. They were looking at a very isolated circumstance, and in fact, the evidence does not support that. And even worse, at least for the Darwinians, is those moths don't land on tree trunks, naturally. The pictures they have of the moths on the tree trunks, the moths were put there by hand in order to take photographs of them. There's no indication at all that pollution on tree trunks would have had any effect on the pepper moths. So that has been completely discounted. Second, the finch beak variations. Charles Darwin, when he was the Galapagos, although he did make a big deal about this in his naturalist notes, he was on the HMS Beagle, this ship, and they traveled around. Um, he claimed later, not, he didn't make a big deal of it, that the size of the finch, of the beaks of the finches, the birds, and those are now called the Darwinian, or Darwin's finches, that it made a difference. They had developed on different islands either heavier beaks for cracking the nuts that they had to eat or longer beaks for reaching into places to get seeds. Well, um, in the 1970s, a group of naturalists, a couple, Peter and Rosemary Grant and their team went there and because of drought, they determined that only that 85% of the, of the finches died out because of a severe drought. They didn't have any food. Well, of the 15% that were left, they all had the similar characteristic. They had heavier beaks, they were larger, the birds, and they said, here's a perfect example of the fact that the whole species has been changed, microevolution, in a very short period of time, over a period of just a couple of years. They identified from that that within only 200 years of similar circumstances, you could have a whole new species develop. Speciation, as it's called, or a biogenesis, could occur in as short a period of time as 200 years, whereas Darwin was talking about tens of thousands of years for speciation, or more. Well, the problem was, after that drought ended, and El Nino caused there to be a lot of rain, there was a lot more food and a lot more finches being born, and when those finches were born, they went right back to having the kind of beaks they had before. In other words, this suggestion of Darwinian evolution that there is a natural progression in one direction has not proven to be true. We have evidence of the fact that it, there is de-evolution de as well. That there is a fluctuation that prevents us from being able to make the argument Darwin made and that is that there is a, an onward marching progression of evolutionary development. That has not proven to be true. And without that, you can't claim that over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years there will be evolution to, to whole new speciation. Okay, make sense? The Third, that we have, um, evolutionary extrapolation. The suggestion that from what limited things, I mean, we, we only live for 100 years or less, most of us. My father-in-law is going to break that, you know, has already broken that. He's 103. Whoa. Carolyn and I expect that we won't have him around more than another 20 or 30 years. <laughs> the way he's going. So, uh, extrapolation means taking the evidence you have and then projecting what it means in a longer term or a larger sense to extrapolate. Well, as one scientist has said, extrapolation is a very dangerous procedure, I'm quoting here. If you observe the growth of a baby during its first months, extrapolation into the future will show you that the child will be eight feet tall when it's six years old. <laughs> well, Darwin and the Darwinians that followed him have done exactly that. They have taken microevolution, small examples of evolutionary, and, and microevolution meaning that there are characteristics that do change over time, we believe that's true. Macroevolution is speciation, whole, the conversion going into whole, creation of whole new species. Um, nothing has ever demonstrated that new species can be developed because of evolution. There is no evidence for that. And that is simply an extrapolation from the evidence we have for microevolution. And in fact, everything we know about the development of new species um, 
would argue against that. I mentioned last week, and those of you who remember me talking about this stuff last week, I hope you'll forgive me. It doesn't hurt to hear it again, I don't think. But a lot of you weren't here, and I think this is this is background for what we're doing. Luther Burbank, one of the most important um, scientists in history in terms of being a breeder of plants and understanding genetic characteristics and how they get passed on. Uh, he personally was responsible for, uh, well, he created the Idaho potato. What else does he need to have done? All right? The Idaho potato was a creation of Luther Burbank. He was then responsible for 800 new kinds of plants that he created by intentional um, selection. That is, uh, artificial selection as opposed to natural selection, which is what Darwin said happened without anybody being involved. Well, Luther Burbank knows as much about crossing plants and creating new species, etc., as anybody who has ever lived. And he said that all species have a proclivity to stay the way they are. In fact, he called that the law of the reversion to the average. Plants do not evolve in one direction, just like you know we talked about the, the finches. That all living things, I'm quoting Luther Burbank now, all living things keep within more or less a fixed set of limitations. And he said that's even true when you're designing plants intentionally. How much more true is that when things are happening by accident? So this extrapolation from small examples to whole, a whole theory of how all life came to be simply is not justified by any evidence we have. We then have, say it with me, ontogeny recapitula recapitulates phylogeny. Ontology, uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny means there used to be a theory which no longer is even mentioned. Uh, it was a theory called biogenesis that said that vertebrates, that is uh, any animal with um, a spinal column, that's a vertebrate, any animal with a spinal column as it is growing as an embryo in its mother's womb or an egg, you know, if it's, if it's a, uh, like a chicken, that as it develops, it will go through a whole series of phases in which it rehearses or, you know, re-illustrates uh, the previous creatures that it evolved from. What that means is a human vertebrate, for instance. They would say that a human embryo starts out looking like a one-celled marine organism, and then it looks like a worm, and then it looks like a fish, and then it looks like an amphibian, and then it looks like a mammal, and then it becomes a human being. So that ontogeny, which means the growth of an embryo, recapitulates phylogeny, means all the different things it descended from. That has now been proven to be false. And in fact, the only reason, that's another one you would have seen in biology books 25, 30 years ago. The only reason that, they, that, that had lasted as long as it did is because this um, artist, a scientist who was an artist uh, named Ernst Hinkle, he drew all these drawings. And in drawing those drawings, he left out, and, and it's all these sort of stages. You know, here's how a human vertebrate looks like a, you know, looks like a worm, looks like a fish, looks like an amphibian, looks like etc. He exaggerated characteristics to make it look like that. He left out phases that did not represent ontogeny, recapitulating phylogeny. He, uh, and the whole thing has been discounted. Everybody looks at that now and goes, he, he was making stuff up. MSU, as my wife and I say. Making stuff up. Completely discounted, not used anymore, and the biogenesis theory of, onto uh, of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny, that vertebrate creatures as embryos represent the things they were descended from, from an evolutionary point of view, is no longer true. And yet you still will hear people saying that. Okay. Darwin's tree of life. Darwin believed and maintained that the fossil record of his day, well, Darwin acknowledged that the fossil record of his day did not support his theories. In other words, because they really didn't have paleontology, it was not developed hardly at all when Darwin was writing this stuff in the mid-19th century. But he was sure that when paleontology, when the collection of fossils and the identification of various fossilized beings when all of that came together, we would be able to see clear evidence of every stage of evolution, from the single-celled organisms to the multi-celled organisms to the creatures that crawled, crawled out of the slimy ooze to the development you know, of birds and lizards and then mammals and mammals. To, and that there would be fossils to demonstrate all of that. He called that the tree of life. Again, you can go back to, to biology books, and they'll have this tree trunk, and it will show that it starts with 
you know, with amino acids and then single-celled animals, etc. And then it branches out and then you have mammals going one way and birds going another way, etc. And all of this stuff. Darwin believed that eventually we would find fossils to demonstrate the connection between all of those different branches on the tree of life. It hasn't happened. We do not have fossil evidence to support any of that tree of life. In fact, there should be two broad patterns of fossil evidence if Darwin is right. First, the earliest strata we have available to us in terms of fossils should be one-celled animals and tiny little animals, you know, the earliest ones, and then they should get bigger as we go along. That's not the case. Some of the oldest fossil evidence we have are fully formed mammals and reptiles, etc. And we have no precursors to those. In fact, we talked about last week that there's a period 50 to 60 billion years ago, um, I'm sorry, 500 to 600 million years ago, the Cambrian explosion, where apparently the vast majority of what we now see of as animal species all arrived at the same time with no precursor fossils. Completely contrary to what Darwin said was going to be the case. And in fact, paleontologists now say they believe we have a very accurate fossil record. We're, it's not like we haven't, there's a lot of stuff we haven't found yet. What's John, the explosion called? Again? The Cambrian explosion. They sometimes call it the biological Big Bang because the suggestion is that so many of these creatures just came full blown without any evidence, fossil evidence, of there having been something prior to that. And, and that the second thing, you know, not only should the earliest be small and then getting more complicated as they go along, but the second aspect of Darwinian's, uh, Darwin's claim was that we should see tiny increments going along. You know, that it should be, we should be able to see because of fossils, all the little steps that bring us to the, to the complex animals we have today. That simply has not been true. There is no evidence of these small incremental increases in the complexity of animals. So Darwin's theory, if it were correct, would suggest that over all of the time that the Earth has been there, there should be just an, a mountain full of transitional creature fossils. We don't have them. They're not there. And the paleontologists say it's not like we haven't dug far enough yet. You know, we. There's not a whole lot out there. Yeah, we'll, we're still finding stuff, but the stuff we're finding is just like the stuff we've already found. You know, they're not finding brand new kind of stuff. So Darwin's tree of life idea is simply falsified by the fossil record, um, which is very significant because his whole claim was, in fact, Darwin said at one point, that we will find that stuff. If we don't, then it's likely my theory is wrong. We haven't. And it's not because we haven't looked, and it's not because we think it's still out there and we just haven't found it yet. The transitional forms consist that this is a subset of Darwin's tree of life. The idea that we should be finding fossils that indicate the trans, you know, the, the transition from lizards to birds, you know, from uh, lizards to mammals. We don't. There's only one example that anybody can ever name. It's the Archaeopteryx, which they say has characteristics of both a bird and a lizard and that it, therefore, is a transitional uh, example. Um, the Archie Archaeopteryx is, it doesn't hold as an example of that because they say, well, it's got claws on, in, in its wings and it's, um, and it's got teeth like a lizard. Well, we have examples of birds today, a bird in South America, the Watson, has teeth rather than a beak, you know, in its beak. So we have birds, birds that are called birds today, not lizards, that have teeth. We also have examples, um, including the ostrich, and uh, there's some other birds that have claws on their wings. They say that, well, the breastbone of this uh, Archaeopteryx indicates it would have had difficulty flying. So it was just beginning to be a bird from being a lizard. Well, not all birds fly. And we have other examples of birds that have a breastbone very much like that. And, and I, I won't go on in the details, but as you tick these things off, you realize we either have examples today that are just like that of birds, so they're, it's, they're not transitional. We also have fossil records from before the time of the Archaeopteryx fossil, which indicate that there were birds that looked like that. So the, the suggestion that this one example is a transitional form is seriously to be questioned. 
And in other kinds of transitional forms, we actually have fewer examples today of what we believe are transitional, you know, that is between one species and another, than what they thought they had in Darwin's time. Some of the ones that Darwin and other naturalists in the 19th century thought might be, might be examples of like a taper turning into a horse have been completely discounted. We have fewer examples that might be transitional today than we did back then. The evidence does not support that claim. Um, similar to that, the whole transitional thing is do we have a common ancestor? The, all of the supposed missing links, you all have been around long enough that you know that the various Piltdown Man and all those things have either determined to be hoaxes or they've determined to be simply a misreading of an ape skull or something else. And some of those, it's quite astonishing, they, they have constructed whole drawings of what the creature would look like based upon two tooths and a metatarsal. I'm not kidding! And yet they come up with all these drawings that make you think you, they know exactly what the thing looked like. Um, we, there has been no support for that kind of thing. Um, and we have to recognize that this, any indication of a specific human ancestor cannot be supported. And there are a number of things about human beings which we see no way that the higher primates, and they say, well, a chimpanzee has two-thirds of the same DNA that we do. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't argue against the existence of a god, because maybe God was smart enough. He said, you know, that was a pretty good organization, that DNA. I think I'm going to use some of that over here. You know, the, I'm going to talk about homology in a minute, which is the same Doesn't thing. Does the mouse have a lot of it, too? Well, a, a lot of creatures do. A lot of animals do. Uh, in <laughs> fact, one of the reasons that they use pigs a lot in research and stuff is because a pig is very similar to us. More similar to some of us than others. <laughs> but, and there are other animals that they will use for research because of similarities. Genetic similarities, physical similarities, etc. But there are several things bipedalism, the, uh, or pedalism, the idea that we walk upright on two legs all the time. Unique to humanity, and there's no clear indication of how we got from the higher apes that, you know, they can stand upright, but they tend to walk on all fours. Um, the idea of a hand with an opposing thumb <coughs> with more dexterous fingers, very significant difference in human beings than others. The modification of the human pharynx that allows us to speak the modification of our central nervous system that allows us to both create and to perceive speech. There are very significant genetic differences, genetic leading to physiological differences in human beings for which we have no explanation how we could have gotten from some other form to where we are today. So there is no evidence for there having been missing links other than, well, there's some genetic commonality. And we could say that doesn't really prove descent with modification. That relates to the next one, homology. You know, um, homology is the suggestion that because there are similarities between different animals, they necessarily have to be um, linked in an evolutionary way. The fin of a whale, the you know the the uh, the end of the wings of some birds, and the human hand have similar number of bones. Well, again, you could I could just as well argue that God, who created everything, designed that, and so it carries on. Is there something that proves an evolutionary connection because most creatures have two eyes and two ears and one mouth? All right? Don't we all have those similarities? And yet there's no indication that every creature that has two eyes and two ears and one mouth is an evolutionary ancestor to a human being. They don't claim that. So similarities in other things, which is what homology means, does not prove anything. You could just as well argue that a god who knew what he was doing, a designer being, use those designs in multiple places because it was a good design. Um, the vestigial organs and systems. At one point there were 85 different vestigial organs or systems in the identified human beings. Vestigial means not having any purpose and vestigial is a carryover from something earlier. That was an argument that we were involved <coughs> because we have things like a tailbone and an appendix. And they used to say a thymus gland and a thyroid gland and, and various other things that we saw no purpose for now. And so they must be part of an earlier evolutionary form that we've now grown from. Well, many of those things they've now, most recently or more recently, discovered purposes of. The tailbone, the coccyx bone, which was thought to be vestigial from when we had a tail, is now known to be an anchor for very important abdominal muscles. 
the um, appendix is actually important in, in the whole human, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? The, as we battle diseases and various, the immunity, the immune system, you know, the, the reason they don't just take everybody's out, appendix out when they're born is because they need it, you know, it's valuable. The thyroid gland was once thought to be, um, be vestigial, clearly it's not. The thymus gland is critical in, in uh, creating immunity in young infants. More and more and more we're finding these things that used to be thought as being unnecessary and just a carryover from earlier evolutionary phases are actually quite important. In fact, um, most recently Dawkins and others have talked about junk DNA, that there is some of our genetic code that does not seem to have any purpose. Well, now they're beginning to figure out it does have purpose. It has controlling purposes on some of the other DNA that we do know what it develops in human beings. All of those things, those are some of the most important points that evolutionary biologists make to claim that we, we clearly, unequivocally, and anybody with any sense would say, are descended from other beings. There are logical arguments. This is why so many scientists, not only religious people, not only philosophers, but scientists are saying this doesn't work, that there are serious problems with Darwinian evolution. Okay? One of the things that has often been said is that Darwinism wins because there's no alternative. In the absence of any other explanation, the Darwinists say, then Darwinism must be right because they will not countenance the fact there really is another explanation. And that explanation, from our point of view, is intelligent design. Now, when I say intelligent design, I don't mean you have to believe that the world is only 6,000 years old or that the world was created in, you know, six 24-hour days. I don't believe those things. Intelligent design simply means that what exists in the world is the product of a conscious being who was powerful enough to decide how to make things and put it together and that he did so. That's all intelligent design means. This was designed, it didn't just happen by chance. There is more than just naturalism, there is supernaturalism. That God is a supernatural being outside the world who made the world and all that's in it. That's what intelligent design means. And I want to spend some time now talking about some of the arguments for intelligent design as an alternative to Darwinism. Some of these arguments are scientific because that's what we've been talking about. Some of them are simply common sense. I mean, they really do rely on that. Um, First, any questions about any of this stuff? I threw that at you really fast this week, faster even than I did last week, but um, to give you kind of a background, for the, the, my point in all of this is, it's not all as obvious as the atheistic Darwinians like Dawkins and others would tell you it is. Some of the things they make as their strongest arguments simply don't hold if you've got any kind of objectivity at all about the thing, all right? So, Design, intelligent design, as an alternative to Darwinism. I'm going to go through a number of arguments. The first one is the argument from uh, design called the teleological argument, as especially as represented by William Paley, who was a 19th century theologian uh, and philosopher. And this argument from design, which is sometimes called the watchmaker argument or the watchmaker analogy, basically says that the complexity of the world demands belief in a creator in the same way that the complexity of a watch demands belief in a watchmaker. Now it's called the teleological argument because teleological means having a goal in mind. Those of you who are in our Christian ethics class, last week we talked about the teleological ethics because that means you have a goal in mind. There's something that you know, which in the case of ethics may be the best good to the most people. That's the goal. And so you call that way of thinking, what's going to be the, I make ethical decisions based upon what's, what's the most good to the most people. That's a teleological ethical argument. Similarly, when we talk about that there is a design, there is a goal in mind that some being, God, we would call him, had some intention or goal in creating things and that that's evidenced by the complexity of it. All right? This sometimes is also called the physico-theological argument, but I don't expect you to remember that. Um, the earliest version of the teleological argument actually goes back to ancient Greece. Uh, Socrates developed it, Plato addressed it some, Aristotle addressed it some, but they sort of went off from Socrates. Then later on, a number of other philosophers, Plotinus and the Stoic philosophers, picked up Socrates' argument that the world must be created based upon a teleological or design argument. 
Later on, it became popularized by Islamic scholars and theologians during the Golden Age of Islam. And I'm going to talk about the Kalam version of the cosmological argument. The, the Islamic scholars in the Golden Age of Islam um, in Baghdad and, and some of the other major centers of Islamic culture in the Middle Ages, they, some of the, some of the most important philosophy ever done were done by Islamic philosophers. So, what is this teleological argument? A number of people have, have represented it. William Paley in 1802 wrote a book which was called, um, oh, what was the name of his book? It was this long, long name. Oh yeah, Natural Theology or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity. The argument, very simply, and, oh, and I should say, this also was part of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, the great scholastic philosopher and theologian. He's Roman Catholic, and in fact, Aquinas' theology and philosophy is still the basis of most Catholic scholarship. Uh, Catholic ethics, for instance, is based upon his ethical treatises. Aquinas had what he called the five ways. The five ways are the five arguments for God. Ontological argument, cosmological argument, teleological argument, etc. He thought that those five, you had to look at all five of them, because together they each address some aspect of it, and that the five of those together uh, would convincingly argue for the existence of God from a philosophical point of view. All right? uh, I'm not going to get into Aquinas further than that, but you need to know that, that's, that, that this was part of what he argued. This actually was the fifth of his five arguments. The argument goes like this. One, a watch has many complex parts. It works, uh, a, it works to a specific and intentional function. It keeps time. And it is intelligently designed to achieve that function. I don't think anybody can argue with that. All right? Um, and let me read you what Paley, how he actually described this in his book. Um, he said, this is how he, in crossing a heath, again, he was British, a heath is a, like a plain, a moor kind of thing. In crossing a heath, suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever. Nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. You know, a stone could have been there, you know, since the, since the world was made. But I suppose, but suppose I had found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer I had given before, that for anything I knew, the watch might have been there always. There must have existed at some time and at some place or other an artificer or artificers, meaning one who makes something, you know, that creates, who formed the watch for the purpose which we find it actually to answer, who comprehended its construction and designed its use. Every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch exists in the works of nature, with the difference on the side of nature of being greater or more, and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. If you found a watch, you would of course assume that somebody had made it at some time. And yet, the universe is so much more complicated than a watch. Then why do we believe that it happened by accident? And yet we would never believe that a watch happened by accident, which relatively speaking is much simpler. So, first, a watch has many complex parts. Similarly, the world has many complex parts. It works a specific and intentional function, especially the sustaining of life, and is intelligently designed to achieve that function. The universe, especially the world we live on, and its ability to sustain life, including especially intelligent life, cannot have accidentally happened any more than a watch could have accidentally happened. Therefore, there is a very high probability that the world, like the watch, was intelligently designed by a creator. Got that? This is actually one of the simplest of the arguments for the existence of God. And, contrary to Darwinian evolution, suggests that things, it, it simply makes no sense. At a certain point, you've got to use some common sense in this stuff, don't you? Nobody would assume that a watch happened by accident. So how do we assume that the world, which is infinitely more complicated than that, happened by accident? Darwinian evolution says that it just takes a long time, and slowly, incrementally, things get you know, improved, 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 until we have this. How long would it take for a watch, relatively simple by comparison to the universe, to accidentally come into being? Do we think that's possible? 
Now, a number of people have argued against this. Most noticeably, um, David Hume, the great Scottish philosopher, who was one of my heroes before I was a Christian, and, and others. And yet, they argue from such a convoluted philosophical point of view, I'm not even going to get into that. Because they, you know, they go against the common sense kind of aspect of this. And I think, you know, the only problem with using common sense is it's not at all common. And people don't tend to get it. But I believe this is a very compelling <coughs> argument. And a lot of other very, very smart people believe it still is as well. That's why we've been using it for 200 years plus. Actually, we've been using it since Socrates, you know, which would be 1400 years, or 2400 years plus. So this is the teleological argument, and it does have to do with science, because it has to do with the complexity of the universe as we experience it. And so therefore is applicable to any discussion of science and origins. We could not have gotten here by accidental, incremental advances over hundreds of thousands of years any more than a watch could, could be created that way. Fair? Questions about that? And when you get into the actual laying out of the, of the syllogism, that is the logical arguments, they're a little more complicated um, in terms of the argument of design. But, yes, sorry. Another aspect of that might be the, uh, the mathematical design or the mathematical explanation mm -hmm. for all this. Which right. It's just marvelously intricate and, and uh, uh, comprehensive. Right. Actually, um, uh, Hoyle, the guy who first, quote, who first coined the term Big Bang Theory, he calculated, and, and you may have heard this, but he actually he was a mathematician, okay, um, and applied his mathematics to astrophysics. But as a mathematician, Hoyle said, the, from a, from a um, likelihood point of view, from a probability point of view, the likelihood that the world in its complexity occurring by accident would be comparable to a tornado blowing through a junkyard and in its wake leaving behind a fully formed and operational 747 jet. <laughs> now, he was no dummy. He was a scientist. He was a mathematician. And he calculated the probabilities as being comparable to a tornado creating a functional 747 jet to all of this having happened by accident. And a lot of other people. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, certainly no slouch when it comes to the science field. I think most people would say Sir Isaac Newton was the most important scientist who ever lived. In looking at, at the regular motion of the planets, he said the regular motion of the planets makes it reasonable to believe in the continued existence of God. In effect, that's, that's the design argument. Rene Descartes, who, who invented, uh, I mean, is a philosopher, I think therefore I am, all of that you know, stuff, philosophy, but he's also a mathematician. He invented Cartesian coordinates. You remember Cartesian coordinates? You remember in geometry where you had the x-axis and the y-axis and you plotted points on them? That's a Cartesian, those are Cartesian coordinates. The x and the y give you that, and then all of the, the various kinds of algebraic equations that come off of that, you know, um, x squared plus 2xy plus y squared equals, all of that's Cartesian mathematics, so the guy was no slouch. Rene Descartes said, the cosmos as a great time machine operating according to fixed laws is as a watch created and wound up by a great watchmaker. Again, it's not just dummies who think that this makes sense. Uh, dummies like me. So, um, there... Some people, um, there was another writer before William Paley named Joseph Butler, who was also a theologian philosopher, and he wrote on this topic as well. He didn't put it just this way. But he said that people may argue from specific instances of design, but, and I quote here, 10,000 instances of design cannot but prove a designer. <coughs> Think of all the different aspects. The infinite, and I'm going to talk about fine-tuning in a minute, where we really get into the science of the thing. The, all of the things that clearly seem to have such a definite, created kind of form. Tens and tens and thousands of those. How many of those do you need before you have to say somebody did this on purpose? And to not say that smacks of lack of common sense to me. I don't care how smart they think they are. Another sort of scientific approach to this, I'm going to give you two related pieces now. Um, 
And they, J.P. Moreland is a scientist who said, it makes no difference whether a scientific theory comes from a dream, the Bible, or bathroom graffiti. The issue is whether independent scientific reasons are given for it. Um, I like that quote. Because, again, some people say, well, they're just speaking from a religious motivation. So what if they are? That has nothing to do with whether or not their theory is viable. Is it defensible? Well, there is a principle called the principle of specified complexity. William uh, Dembski is a mathematician, philosopher, a apologist, he's a Christian, who presented this uh, argument. He's got a book called No Free Lunch, in which he's, his argument is that everything, you know, you can't just say it all happened by accident. There's something going on here. Um, the idea of specified complexity is when we look at the created world. Again, we're talking science here. There are four, four points he makes. First, he's talking about molecular complexity, and this is why this connects to the next thing I'm going to talk about, which is irreducible complexity. Molecular machines evidence specified complexity. Specified complexity he defines as being contingent, complex, and specified. So what does that mean? Well, contingent means that they um, didn't create themselves. They had to come from somewhere, right? That's what contingency means. You come from something else created. You, you came from somewhere. Now, Darwin and his followers would say it happened by accident over a long period of time because of um, descent by, um, by modification. Complex means it's got more than one part. You know, there is some complex combination of things. And specified means it serves a specific purpose. You could say this, this applies to the watchmaker analogy, that a watch is contingent, somebody made it, it came from somewhere, it is complex, it's got all these different parts that work together, and it's specified, it does a particular purpose, it's, it keeps time, right? Well, molecular machines are demonstrated to the, in having the same things. Second point, specified complexity cannot be explained on the basis of chance or necessity, or the combination of chance and necessity. In other words, for something to be not, not, it didn't produce itself, to have multiple parts that work together to achieve an end, and to have a very specific end, logically that cannot be by chance. Again, you can see how this is kind of a modern scientific expression of the watchmaker analogy. Third, intelligent agency is a known cause which does produce specified complexity. We have no examples of chance having done that, no matter how much they might claim. And then fourth, therefore, the best explanation for specified complexity in molecular machines or anything else is intelligent design. One of the examples that they use for specified complexity is the design in a bee's honeycomb. All right? You've seen a honeycomb. Every hexagonal cell is exactly the same shape. They're laid out in an exact grid. So it is, and it had to be made, it had to be made by bees, so it's contingent. It was complex. You know, the, the geometry of these things are extraordinary, and they're all perfect, exactly perfect. And they're specified. They have a particular purpose for the keeping of larvae, for the storing of food for those larvae, etc. Um, did that happen by accident? No, the bees made it. All right, well, where did the bees get the ability to make that? You know, you follow that back. I'm going I'm to get to the infinite regression uh, kind of question in a minute. So this is one of the arguments that the natural world demonstrates to us specified complexity. The next one I want to talk about, which is sort of an offshoot of that and, and more in depth, is the idea of um, irreducible complexity. A man named Michael Behe, um, one of the very first books I ever read on this topic was Behe's book called Darwin's Black Box. You know what a black box is. It's that thing, you know, the sort of mysterious box on airplanes that keeps track of, of what happened and what's going on. Well, he, he called this book uh, Darwin's Black Box because Charles Darwin had no concept of a molecular world. They didn't know about molecules. They didn't know, you know, Darwin had no idea how genetics worked. It was only when Gregor Mendel, who lived during the same time period, uh, came up with that, that it all began to make sense. So it was completely a black box as far as Darwin. He didn't understand how this stuff worked. Well, Michael Behe gets into the discussion of molecular machines. He is a microbiologist. And as Michael Behe started studying these various kinds of microorganisms, 
he began to see evidence of highly developed mechanisms within these molecular, these tiny beings. Uh, one of the, the best examples of that is a flagellum. You know what a fl flagellum is? Flagellum is a microscopic creature, you know, microscopic, no, it's microscopic, <laughs> that um, is in liquid, and it moves itself around by means of the fl flagella, which is a tail. That, and the thing about this tail, if you ever see, you know, the, the films of the microscope, and the, you know, it looks like it's just wagging. Actually, the tail is spinning. The flagellum has, when we've studied it, inside its body, it's an outboard, mo it's a, it's an outboard motor. It has all of the same pieces that an outdoor motor has. It has a propeller, in effect, this tail that comes out. It has a rope, which is a rotor device. Um, it has a, a hook, which attaches that to the rest of the, the animal. It is a, it's an animal, it's an organism. Um, the, it has a drive shaft, it has a motor, it, it uses the flow of acid from outside the bacterium to the inside to create a chemical reaction which causes it to turn. It has a bushing membrane which allows this thing to move inside itself. It's got all the same pieces that you would need to make an outdoor motor work to drive a propeller. Now, the concept of, uh, that Behe develops, which is called irreducible complexity, it says all of those things could not, all of the pieces that are necessary to make that up could not all have developed according to natural selection. Because natural selection requires that each characteristic had to develop one step at a time to its current complexity. But you needed to have a half a dozen different things all develop to the state of complexity and all of them working together in order to create this. All right? Now, let me give it to you in a different way. I don't actually have the slides, so I'm going to look around. An irreducibly complex system is one in which several well-matched interacting parts contribute to the basic function wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Does that make sense? If you've got an outdoor motor, if you take off the propeller, it doesn't work. If you take off the drive shaft, it doesn't work. If you take out the bushings, it doesn't work. If you take out the, uh, the gasoline, it doesn't work. All the pieces have to work together. Now, continuing. Irreducibly complex systems cannot be produced by slight successive modifications of a precursor or an earlier system, which is the definition of Darwinian evolution. You start with something and it gets a little more complex, a little more complex, a little more complex, a little, and each, time, each step in that complexity, that increased modification, is necessarily an advantage or it would not have continued. If it didn't create an advantage, then natural selection says it would have been wiped out. So each step along the way has to be an improvement. Well, when you've got all of these pieces working together at once, any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional and therefore would not have continued to develop by evolution. You can't get half a dozen pieces, all of which must be fully developed and working together in order to gain an advantage no one of those could have developed to that level of complexity because they wouldn't have helped and they would have been, from an evolutionary point of view, gotten rid of. Does that make sense? All of the pieces had to be there together at one time in order for it to work at all. So evolution can't explain that. It's irreducibly complex. You can't take a step backward from that and have it make any sense from an evolutionary point of view. A, a, a very practical kind of example uh, that Behe uses is a mousetrap. A mousetrap has at least five different pieces. It has the platform that it's on, it has the, the spring, it has the hammer, the thing that actually falls on the mouse, it has the trap, the thing that holds it down. Um, you know, it's got all these pieces. You have to have all of those pieces or the mousetrap doesn't work. And somebody had to decide to put all of those pieces together in just such a way that it would do what it was supposed to do. If you couldn't say, okay, I've got this little piece of wood and I'm going to lay it there on the table and wait until it develops a spring and a hammer and a trip and all that kind of stuff. It's either all there or it's not there at all. That's the principle of irreducible complexity. And Behe, being a microbiologist, has identified that there are a lot of things like that. 
The flagellum being one of the most popular, and there are diagrams you can see of all that. I didn't bring, put any of those up here. But uh, the, the um, psyllum that we have, which are these little, like in our, in our uh, respiratory system, there are these little things like ores that have a very specific kind of um, capability. They move phlegm upward through our system so that you can cough them out when you need to. Uh, there are all kinds of things like that that are so, so complex, there's no way they could have gotten there in stages because there are too many pieces that would have had to have been there at the same time or else it wouldn't have given you an advantage. Behe says this, since natural selection can only choose systems that are already working, again, if they're not working, there's no advantage, can only choose systems that are already working, then if a biological system cannot be produced gradually, it would have to arise as an integral unit in one fell swoop for natural selection to have anything to act on. Evolution can't explain how these, these complex systems come to be. And yet, Charles Darwin said this, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find no such case. Well, we know of cases now. And yet, I'll give you an example. When, when um, Michael Behe first published this, Richard Dawkins and some others accused him of being lazy. Because they said, you're lazy, because if you weren't lazy, you would keep looking until you find some way that this could have been developed from an evolutionary point of view. Really? That's the only, only response they have. You just haven't worked hard enough to find out how evolution could have produced this. Well, logically, evolution couldn't have produced this. It violates the very principles of what you know, descent by modification maintains. Uh, Harold, Franklin Harold, scientist, said, this, and this is an example, I gave you some examples last week of the kinds of absurd quotes that some evolutionary uh, atheists will say, like, you know, even if, it's just, even if it's just made up, even if it doesn't make any sense, even if it's just a what-if story, we're still going to buy that instead of believing in, in intelligent design. And they admit, a lot, the best of them admit that their arguments don't hold, but they're unwilling to give up naturalism because it's an ideology, and that is their ideology, and they won't give it up, even if nothing makes sense in support of it. Franklin Harold, who is um, a Darwinian scientist, said this, We should reject as a matter of principle the substitution of intelligent design for the dialogue of chance and necessity, but we must concede that there are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical system, only a variety of wishful speculations. He's a Darwinian evolutionist who says the only thing they have are wishful speculations and that they cannot explain this kind of stuff. Comments? Questions? Yes? Just, I mean, it's, I was a beekeeper at one point, and we found that, and bees are having a hard time at this point, right. and when bees make their own comb from scratch, the comb is bigger than when you buy a platform for the bee to make it on. You know, they have a, like a pre-designed, human pre-designed. Right. Are smaller cones so that you can lift them out of the hive, and you know. so you can lift them out of the hive. Now you can have them within a frame, build its own comb, but they make bigger bees if they build it themselves. And if you put it smaller, and then the bees are smaller, and they ended up being more susceptible to disease, and you, know, you had more bees. But now that's one of the theories why we're having so much problem with bees now. Colony, com, colony collapse syndrome. Yeah. Co the colony collapse was caused by a, by a virus or a little mite, but, but because for so many, so many years they've been inbred and, you know, there was a guy that did that too, that right. um, created new species or new, you know, different, different kinds of bees that were maybe a little more hardy, but now the bees are small and yeah. And yep. it's not working anymore. Okay, let me... <laughs> yes. 
I was going to comment that <clears throat> this what the zero reducible complexity also has been applied to a pseudopod or a false foot that occurs in an amoeba. This one cell animal uses a, a little thing that sticks out and pulls it along. It's, it's right. a false foot, a pseudopod, a false foot. And that, that the operation of that false foot takes 200 different proteins operating together as a group in order to make that, that pseudopod right. work. If any, any one of those proteins is missing, it doesn't work anymore. Right. And they had to all be there at the same time and develop at the same so how does that happen in, in <coughs> tiny stages to get to that point? We have a lot of examples of that. And the evolutionary biologists either resort to saying, well, we have no explanation for that, but we're not going to agree that in design. Or they call names. You know, Dawkins is famous for that, as is Sam Harris. You know, they, just, they just call people names. I want to give you another quote here. Behe's latest definition, I mean, he's been challenged a lot, and et cetera. His latest definition of irreducible complexity is this. An evolutionary complex, I'm sorry, an irreducibly complex evolutionary pathway is one that contains one or more unselected steps, that is, one or more necessary but unselected mutations. The degree of ir uh, uh, irreproducible complexity is, uh, I'm sorry, irreducible complexity is the number of unselected steps in a pathway. In other words, he's even tried to put this in the terms the evolutionary biologists would understand using their terminology, but he still gets the place of saying, you can't get there from here. Even trying to, trying to explain it from your point of view, it simply doesn't add up. It doesn't work. Okay? Yes? The, uh, the other thing that's interesting about this deal is that in a human being, there are literally thousands of different proteins that are, that are existent in a, in a human being, all of which are necessary for the human being to live. Right. Well, and there was one missing, they're gone. There was an experiment that gets quoted often, you know, the idea that, that life began as a chemical pool and that various amino acids developed, and those amino acids then were joined together to create proteins, and the proteins were, uh, came together in complex ways to create single cell organisms. The single cell organisms, you know, developed into larger organisms and they crawled out of the slime and all that. Well, an experiment was done a number of years ago uh, in which they, they tried to reproduce by the application of electricity to, uh, you know, chemical pools as, that they, and they said they were able to develop, doing that, an amino acid. And so everybody's going, see, it works! Well, they developed one amino acid. And they were do, trying intentionally, on purpose, to do the thing, you know, really working at it. And yet the claim that thousands of different amino acids that were combined in intricate ways to produce hundreds of different kinds of proteins, to produce the tiniest of single cell now, how far do you have to go from one amino acid to having a creature that crawls out of the ooze? They didn't prove anything. Really? Okay, we're going to take a break, but go ahead. The other interesting thing about that is all, all of life depends on a particular type of protein that if you put light through it, it turns the light to the left. And, and if you have random chance amino acid uh, acids, they'll, they'll be 50% will turn right and 50% will turn left, yet light depends on the legal road corridor. Well, they only, found, they only were able to create one amino acid as much as they tried. By, by, you know, by this chemical process. Okay, let's take a break. Yeah, I was just asking a question, and let me clarify. I am not in any way saying that atheism equals Darwinism. But the fact is that Darwinism, which offers a naturalistic explanation for everything, life, you know, the universe, the world, that, uh, well, Darwinism especially is in, uh, concerned about biological things, so life, it supports atheism in that it gives a naturalistic explanation for how life could have come to be. And for that reason, most of the people who claim to be atheists would also claim to be Darwinists because apart from the Darwinian explanation for how life came to be, you know, the, there's very little other option in the, in the world today except to believe in God. So it ends up being those two choices. Really, believe in God or believe in Darwinism if you, have, if you ever bother to ask the question, how did life come to be? Okay. All right, I want to now go to perhaps one of the most, well, I think the most significant argument uh, against a naturalistic explanation for the creation of the universe 
and of human life, and an argument for the existence of God. So this is, it's not an alternative to Darwinism so much as just stepping back even further in terms of how, how the universe came to be able to support life. Now let me start with giving you a little analogy. Suppose you were on, you, you signed on with Elon Musk's project to go to Mars. And you get to Mars, first people ever to go to Mars, and when you get there you find a structure, a domed structure, that when you enter it, the temperature is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the humidity is about 50 percent, there's an oxygen recycling system, there's a system for gathering energy from the sun, there is a system for producing food, all of those things are there, and this dome structure appears to have everything necessary for sustaining life. Do you think it would be rational to assume that that was all, hap all there by accident? <laughs> that it just happened to be there? Obviously not, right? I don't think any sensible person would think that all of that happened by accident. Well, the thing we're going to talk about right now, the fine-tuning teleological argument, identifies the fact that all of those characteristics I just identified exist, and more, exist here to support life. In very scientific terms, okay? This is the fine-tuning teleological argument. Teleological because it indicates that there was a purpose, you know, there was a, a goal that was being achieved in designing this. Fine-tuning in terms of this, this version of the teleological or design argument says that Scientific discoveries, more and more all the time, are identifying what we would call cosmic constants that have existed since the creation of the universe, the Big Bang, or however you want to see that, um, and that those values are such that if they varied even very, very slightly, then life on Earth would not be possible. And I, when I say constants, we currently identified around 200 different physical constants in the universe, that if they varied, we would not be able to sustain life. Um, Freeman Dyson, the Princeton physicist, said this, there are many lucky accidents in physics. Without such accidents, water could not exist as liquid, chains of carbon atoms would not form complex organic molecules, and hydrogen atoms could not form breakable bridges between molecules. In short, life as we know it would be impossible. Lucky accidents in physics. Um, Fred Hoyle, I quoted him earlier. That he's the one that's, that talked about, he's the one that quote that first coined Big Bang. He's the one that said that a tornado creating a 747 is about the same probability as, as life be existing. Fred Hoyle said, I do not believe that any scientist who examines the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics have been deliberately designed with regard to the consequences they produce inside stars. If this is so, then my apparently, then my apparently random quirks have become part of a deep laid scheme. If not, then we're back again at a monstrous sequence of accidents. The fine tuning, I'm going to give you some examples of it. For instance, the rate of expansion of the universe, assuming the Big Bang, which I believe the Big Bang is probably a wonderful explanation for what Genesis 1 means when it says, and God said, let there be life, and there was life. Okay. Um, if the rate of expansion of the universe were different by as little, that is different meaning more or less, by as little as 1 over 10 to the 60th power, the universe would either have collapsed or would uh, have expanded too rapidly for stars to form. That means 1 over 10 with 60 <coughs> zeros after it. Statistically, um, that would be the equivalent of standing on one side of the known universe and shooting a gun and hitting a target that is one inch square on the other side of the universe. I'm not exaggerating, that's the statistical probability. So the point is, if the, if the Big Bang had caused the universe to expand 1 over 10 to the 60th power faster, then it would have expanded too fast for stars to form and for anything, any planets to then form. If it had expanded sl more slowly by 1 over 10 to the 60th power, it would have caved back in on itself. See why it's called fine-tuning? 
The statistical likelihood that that happened by accident is extraordinary. All right? Secondly, the strong nuclear force. There are a number of uh, major forces in physics. Gravity is one, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, etc. <coughs> the strong nuclear force is the force that binds protons and neutrons together. If it was either 5% stronger or weaker, then life would not be possible. <coughs> the force of gravity. If gravity had been stronger or weaker by even 1 over 10 to the 40th power, then stars would not support life, stars that, that could support life, like our sun, would not have been formed. Okay? You wouldn't have any yellow stars. They would all be red giants or it would be something else that, according to astrophysicists, cosmologists, are incapable of supporting life. I only gave you those three, but I could go on. If the neutron were not about 1.001 times the mass of the proton, then all protons would have decayed into neutrons, or all neutrons would have decayed into protons, and life could not be possible. 1.001 .001 is the weight of a neutron versus a proton. It's one one thousandth heavier. And if it weren't exactly that, if it were more or less than one one thousandth, life could not exist. Um, if the electromagnetic force, which gravity, strong nuclear, weak nuclear, electromagnetic are the major forces in the universe. If the electromagnetic force were slightly, even slightly stronger or weaker, then there are a number of reasons why life would not be possible. And on and on and on. They estimate there are like 200 different factors like that now. And the extent to which all of the calc you know, all of it has to be so exact, which is why they call it fine tuning, something burning. Yeah. yeah, there is. Yeah. Somebody turn the stove on? Thank you, Guillermo. Um, oh, they may be making their lunch. Yeah, they, they get the fire on, going. Um, the fact that all of these factors of fine tuning were necessary for life is beyond question. Nobody challenges that anymore. So we're at the point where some of the evolutionary uh, thinkers believe that all of this still happened by accident. Philosopher John Leslie pointed out, clues heaped upon clues can constitute weighty evidence despite any doubts about any one element of the pile. There are just Work too many options. Is that the workers? Workers. Yeah. The cooking. <laughs> okay. Um, this fine-tuning argument is widely considered perhaps the strongest argument in favor of the fact that this did not have a biopsy. This was designed. So much so that a number of, of people of significance have said they can't believe in random evolution anymore. Anthony Flew was a British philosopher who a couple of years ago, he's, he was 93 I think at the time, but still very much had his head about him. He finally said there is too much evidence in the fine-tuning arguments to suggest that this had to be that this had to be intentional. Now he was not prepared to become a theist, which means he believes in a personal God, but he was prepared to become a deist, meaning he believes there is some divine force, there is something supernatural. And he used to be a strong advocate of atheism and Darwinian evolution. Anthony Flew. You can look him up. Yes. So how do atheists or Darwinians explain this? Well, they have a number of different arguments um, that, that, that don't make sense to me, to be quite honest. One of the arguments they make is they would say, well, the reason why all of these things exist, um, as just as they are, all the fine-tuning elements, is because there is some even bigger, more fundamental fit law of physics that drives all of that. Okay. And so all of these things are, are, are organized and oriented because of some other law. Some people have related that to Einstein's effort to find a unified field theory. That there's one sort of one law, one, one theory that ties gravity and electromagnetism and strong and, and, and weak nuclear forces, you know, one thing that will explain all of it. Well, the problem is, by them saying, well, there's, there, there's some, one fundamental law of physics that's larger than that that drives all of those, all you've done is you've moved the the argument one step earlier. Well, what caused that to be there so that it could create all of these things? You know, so that's one of the arguments they make. Um, 
They will also argue that, well, if the, 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 they'll argue the anthropic principle, as it's called, which says, well, if all of these things weren't exactly the way they were, then we wouldn't exist. And if we didn't exist, then we couldn't be even talking about this. So this is just the way it happened. But as someone has, there's um, John Leslie, the same guy I quoted a minute ago, he has, he has said that's, that's addressed by the firing squad analogy. The firing squad analogy would say, okay, if there are 50 sharpshooters, and you're set in front of those 50 sharpshooters, and they're going to execute you, and all 50 of these guys shoot at you, and they all miss. You could say, well, the only reason I'm here telling you about this is because they all missed. That doesn't explain why they all missed. <laughs> you know, you're not explaining anything by saying, well, we're here to talk about it, and so therefore, that, that, you know, that's why all of those things are like that. Uh, divine intervention. Yeah, divine intervention. You know, they, either something really serious happened, or they missed you on purpose. And there, there's some intentionality behind that somewhere. You see my point? Yes. And I think that, that you know, that's the right answer to the anthropic, the idea, well, if, if it weren't all exactly like that, we just wouldn't be here to talk about it. There's also the argument that um, people will say, well, okay, but if you say God designed all this stuff, then who designed God? Where did God come from? All right? That's, I, I've actually had people say that to me. But that, um, our response to that is, by definition, God is the one beyond that. I mean, you know, the, the one who is beyond. And they say, well, if you think the world is too complex to have happened by, by accident, God would have to be more complex than that. So how do you explain where God came from? That's, that's, go back to the analogy I gave you when we started about the Mars dome. Okay. You say, oh, well, this, must, this, this biosphere on Mars, which has everything we need to sustain life, must have happened by accident, because the only alternative is to believe that there's even more complicated being who came here to make this. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that there's not all this evidence that there must have been somebody who put this here. Saying that, well, we can't explain God. I don't know who, you know, in the case of Mars, I may not know who it was that put the stuff there. I, who built that dome, who made it able to sustain life, oxygen and food and the right temperature and everything else. I may not be able to explain that. But that doesn't change the fact that it's there. And that there's no other explanation for it than somebody with intelligence must have put it there, right? Does that, you know, so we're just, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're just trying to head fake when we say, well, who made God, you know? Um, and by definition, it's uh, Aquinas, in all of his arguments, the five ways of God, he would say, so there must be some cause, you know, the first mover, the, the prime mover, etc. And he said, and that is what we know of as God. That was his conclusion of all of his arguments. So ultimately, when they say, well, where did God come from? I don't have to answer that question. You know, all you're doing is you're trying to dodge the issue of where did all of this rest of this stuff come from. All I'm saying is that a being that I can't explain must be behind it. There must be an intelligence behind it. And I don't have to be able to explain where that deity came from. Make sense? Doesn't change the fact that there still has to be some explanation there. And, you know, and the explanation is not natural. Uh, it can't be. It's too complicated for that. The other thing that they will argue is the multiverse, or the mini-world theory, uh, which suggests that there are many universes, there are many worlds, some of them may be just dimensions of one another, and we just happen to live in one where all of the physical elements are, you know, if there are an infinite number of these, we happen to be in the one that has all of these pieces that work in the way, all of these fine-tuning elements, gravity and electromagnetic and strong and weak nuclear forces and all the things necessary for life to exist. Well, there's several problems, and, and they have two versions of that, by the way, I should say. They have what's called a vacuum fluctuation model, and then they have the oscillating Big Bang model. The vacuum fluctuating model says that um, there is some source, something that produces these worlds. There is some hotbed of world universe generation, and so like, like a big bed of soap, and the soap bubbles are coming off of it, all right? That's the best description for this vacuum oscillating uh, theory, uh, vacuum fluctu fluctuation theory. And the other one, the Big Bang oscillation, is that the Big Bang expands out, and then it caves in on itself, and then it expands out, and it caves in on itself. And every time it expands, it's got a different set of physical attributes. And we happen to be in the expansion that has these particular physical attributes and eventually it'll cave in on itself. 
Well, there's several problems with that. One, there's no evidence for that anywhere. The only evidence they've ever given for that uh, or suggestion is that in quantum mechanics, the appearance of quantum particles from we know not where, they identify that as being from the, the, the quantum vacuum. Okay. It is the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty identifies the fact that particles at a, a quantum atomic level do appear and disappear. And we don't actually know where they come from or where they go. But the suggestion that they come from nowhere and go to nowhere is not true. We believe that there is a quantum vacuum that they appear from and disappear to. Does not suggest that there is another world somewhere or another universe somewhere. And that's the only even possible evidence they have for it. The rest of it is simply things that they have made up in order to try to explain how did all of this come to be so exactly perfect for life to exist. So it is purely a narrative that someone has come up with. Um, there are a number of other arguments. For instance, if you say, okay, this vacuum fluctuating field that produces universes like bubbles, um, where did that come from? Again, all they've done is they have moved the argument back one step. They have not, they have not dispensed with the idea that there must be some creative intelligence behind all of that. Um, there, uh, there are a bunch of different reasons. I mean, you can go online and, and, and read the arguments against the multiverse kind of idea, but the biggest thing to me is there's no evidence of that. It is simply a narrative that they've come up with. Um, and I had a good quote here. Uh, if I can find it. Where is it? Talk amongst yourselves. Um, anyway, about a scientist, an evolutionary scientist who said that we have no evidence, who admitted we have no evidence for any of this, there is nothing to prove any of this, and so therefore we must fall back on the thing that science always falls back on, and that is creating a narrative. That's a fancy way of saying making up a story <laughs> without, any, without any evidence to explain it. I um, wish I could find that. Oh, and here's, a, here's an analogy in terms of the multiverse uh, kind of idea, um, why we, we don't believe it. Suppo you know, we all know there are dinosaur bones. We've all found dinosaur bones. I mean, we haven't found them, but the, the paleontologists have found a lot of them, and you've probably seen them in museums. I've seen a whole brontosaurus or a brachiosaurus skeleton in Dubai. And so... Oh, there's a whole in Mexico. What's that? There's a whole dinosaur exactly. field in Mexico. Exactly. Well, suppose somebody came along who didn't believe in dinosaurs. And this person proposed that instead of there having actually lived dinosaurs that produced these bones, there was a dinosaur bone producing field that produced dinosaurs out of thin air. Right? And that's where the bones came from. Now, the principle here is that we always, as a general rule, should base, all other things being equal, we should base any hypothesis we have either on actual evidence or on natural extrapolations from what we know. In other words, rather than just make something up, either have evidence for it or have some reasonable explanation for why you believe that might be true. If somebody said that all the dinosaur bones in the world were created by a dinosaur bone producing field, what would we say? That's crazy. You're making stuff up. MSU. Making stuff up. Because there is no evidence. There is no logical, we have neither any evidence for that, nor is there anything in our experience from which we may extrapolate to propose the reality of a bone producing field of some kind. Right? Well, when they suggest a multi multiverse kind of or a mini world kind of strategy that there is a vacuum fluctuating field that produces this, there is that's neither a direct result of any evidence nor is it an extrapolation from anything we actually know. Whereas the idea of there being an intelligent being who is sufficiently powerful to have created all this is based upon about the whole human experience of the divine. We have never had a society ever in the history of human sociological or, or anthropological studies that did not have some concept of the divine, of the supernatural. They, we have always believed in that. And human experience has always verified that. So we do have human experience from which we may extrapolate a reasonable 
estimation that there is a divine being capable of doing this. And so that makes sense. But the extrapolation to from, from nothing to a vacuum fluctuating multiverse is like somebody saying dinosaur bones come from a dinosaur bone producing field. There's no, there's no connection there. Does that make sense? So, um, so, as we used to say in the South, that dog won't hunt. <laughs> um, still hoping I find that great quote about, you know, we'll do what we've always done, and that is make stuff up. Um, okay. Any questions about that? Again, the fine tuning based on science, not based upon religious belief is one of the most important, most significant, most convincing arguments today for the fact that this had to be done by an intelligence and that intelligent design explains it better than any naturalistic explanation. Are you beginning to get a sense there are too many holes in the naturalistic, materialistic explanation for life and how the universe came out? There's one more I want to give you which is somewhat based upon science. It's also based upon philosophy. And I may lose you on this one. But that's okay. <laughs> um, this is the Kalem cosmological argument. I mentioned to you that from the Greek philosophers that the, um, the Islamic philosophers of the Middle Ages, and their philosophy was extraordinary. Kalem is actually a, an Arabic word. Um, and so the Kalem cosmological argument, is a modern reformulation of the old cosmological argument, that is the argument of a prime mover. Everything had to come from somewhere. There's always been a principle since the early Greek philosophers that uh, something cannot come from nothing. Everything has to have some beginning, some source. So this is a reformulation of that cosmological argument of prime mover or first cause that has served as a key component in Christian apologetics in response to the new atheism particularly William Lane Craig, who we studied in our first apologetics class. One of our books was by William Lane Craig. He's a very deep thinker. You know, you better be wearing your, your big girl pants when you, when you start reading William Lane Craig, because he's tough, okay? Uh, right? Some of you have read his stuff, and he's a very deep thinker, but he's hard work, okay? Um, he has been the modern, uh, sort of, he, he kind of reinvigorated the Kalem cosmological argument, and He's been opposed by a lot of people, he's been supported by a lot of people, but Michael Martin is a philosopher who has said that Craig's revision of the Kalem argument, and I quote, is among the most sophisticated and well-argued in contemporary theological philosophy. Um, it, it appeals to both metaphysical, philosophical arguments, and also to some new scientific evidence related to fine-tuning and things of that sort. Now, um, and the... The Arabic word, ilim al-kalam, means the science of discourse or of rational speculation. And that's why it's called the Kalem argument. Um, it goes like this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Going all the way back to Plotinus and others in Greek philosophy, something cannot come from nothing. All right? Here, and I'm going to come back to that because that's... This is the part that most people challenge if they disagree with it, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Secondly, the universe did begin to exist. It used to be believed that the universe had always existed, and then they stopped believing that, and the Big Bang Theory is the modern explanation for how it all started. Third, therefore, the, the universe had a cause or a beginning. Something caused it to happen. Point number four in the argument, if the universe had a cause, then an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists who is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. Now this is the thing about the Kalem argument that is different than the standard cosmological argument. It not only postulates the existence of a creator being, but it gives us a sense of the nature of that creator being. And I'll tell you why. Because when we say everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause, part of the understanding of the argument of prime mover or first cause is that something cannot be the cause of something greater than itself. Right? Something cannot be, the prime mover cannot, 
create a motion greater than itself. I cannot push a car faster than I can run. I mean, if it has some other sort of motivation, then it may be, but there's, I, can't, I can't move anything, I can't cause anything, I can't create anything greater than myself. You know, you might, well, if it's, we're talking about organic organisms, if I had a child, that child might grow up and be taller than me, but it's going to take a long time. Initially, I cannot create something greater than myself. Well, the world is caused, it had a beginning, it changes, it is material, it has, it is under the control of uh, the auspices of time, I mean time occurs, it is in space, therefore anything that could create a universe that has those characteristics must be greater than those characteristics. Follow me so far? So therefore, the cause for a universe that had a beginning, is changing, is material, is bound by time, is bound in space, must be, therefore, beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and therefore enormously powerful to create the universe that it is. You understand that argument? Now, obviously, books and books and books, books and books and books have been written to expound on all of this stuff. But the conclusion, therefore, an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists, who is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. Now, I will tell you where people, and that you, you got that, okay? You understand that argument. And as I say, the difference between the Kalem cosmological argument and earlier, or different cosmological arguments, is they only establish the existence of a prime mover or first cause. They do not include the characteristics that would be necessary for a prime mover or first cause for this kind of universe. Yes, John? Um, is, is this where Aquinas got his prime Basis, no. Actually, the, the, the early Greek philosophers, Socrates especially, argued the cosmological argument that there must be a prime mover or a first cause. That became the seed for Aquinas. Okay. Uh, Aquinas dealt a lot with Plato, for instance. But that same source, when it was taken into some of the Arabic, the, the Islamic Arabic philosophy, they expanded it into the Kalem argument. The cosmological argument existed before. Sounds yeah. very much like Aquinas. What well, does? I mean, he draws the same conclusion, but this, again, the difference here is that it goes into some detail about what the nature of that creator being must be. All right? Now, the place where people argue about this, and I'm, I'm just doing this to mess with you, because this is going to, um, because, is the first principle. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The problem people have with that is the beginning to exist part. Involved in the Kalem argument from the very early days of the Islamic philosophers is the idea that it is not possible to have an infinite regression of real things. Let that sink in for a minute. When we talk about in, you know, an infinite set of numbers, you guys have had math, when they talk about infinite numbers, that is an abstract concept. All right? You can say for every n, whatever the number is, there's an n plus 1. There's always another number, right? There's no, it's not like we only have a certain number of numbers and then it stops. It goes on forever. It gets so big we don't have names for them after a while, but it goes on forever. But when you're talking about a, a, a set of real things, you cannot propose an infinite set of real things. It had to start somewhere. It can't go on infinitely in the past. Time can't. Now let me, let me give you a couple of the arguments that have been made for, for that. And why? Because this is the argument they make against this. There, it, uh, a German philosopher named David Hilbert proposed what's called Hilbert's Hotel to try to illustrate that you cannot have an infinite number of real things. You can only have an abstract set of infinites. Hilbert's hotel, his analogy, he said, suppose you have an hotel, a hotel that has an infinite number of rooms, and every room is occupied, <coughs> right? Well, somebody shows up, and they say, I'd like a room. Well, the, room, the hotel has an infinite number of rooms, but they're all occupied. But you can tell the person in room number one 
to move to room number two. And the person in room number two to room move to room number three. The person in room number three to move to four, who moves to five, who moves to six. And because it's infinite, you now have room for another person. In fact, using that same principle, you could have an infinite number of new guests come along, even though your infinite number of rooms in the hotel are already full. Now, the point in that is that the concept of a real set of infinite things, like a number of hotel rooms, um, becomes irrational at a certain point. There is no rationality to a real infinite set of things. Do we have any mathematicians in the group? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> and let me give you why that affects the universe. You've all, you've all probably, you, you may have heard this analogy. Between point A and point B, if I've got, if, if I've got point A and point B, and I say that from point A, I'm going to move halfway to point B, and then I'm going to move halfway to point B, and then I'm going to move halfway to point B, and then I'm going to move halfway to point B. Will I ever get there? No. You're going to get awfully close. But as long as you're always saying halfway, you are creating, that's like n plus one half, okay? You're creating an infinite number of steps in between, but that becomes irrational at a certain point. Think of the same thing happening into the past in time. If we think that the past is infinite, and, and, and we're going we're gonna to go back to the creation of things, you know, we're going to go back to the infinity of time, you can never get there. Okay? No matter how far back you go, there's still further, and there's still further, and there's still further. It becomes irrational at that point. Well, the same thing works in the other direction. If the universe is infinite in its beginning, it never could have gotten here. Because from an infinity, it would come halfway, then you'd have half of infinity, and then halfway, and that's half of infinity, and then halfway, and that's half of infinity, and you'd never get to the present moment. It is irrational to think of the universe always existing. It is not possible, because every moment of time is a real thing. It's a real moment in time. It's like those hotel rooms. You cannot conceive of an infinite number of real things, whether you're applying it to Hilbert's hotel and an infinite number of hotel rooms, or an infinite number of moments from the past to here. And so therefore, there must have been a beginning somewhere. It is irrational to conceive of an infinite amount of time. Okay, are your heads exploding yet? I don't, I don't get where it says, but the, the question, number one, how does that, how does that concept? Because their argument with number one is they say, it's not true that the universe began to exist. Well, then why are we here? I mean, I mean how come well, the, we're here? Well, the, 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 the old argument was that the universe has always existed. And so even though most people believe that the universe did have a beginning with the Big Bang, they would say it is not logically necessary, that it could potentially have been an infinite amount of time. Well, the response to that, philosophically speaking, is no, it couldn't have been an infinite amount of time. It had to start somewhere, because it's irrational to think that it, it, it existed infinitely. Not even mentioning the fact that, the, that the, usual, the typical theory now, the Big Bang theory, is that it did have a moment in time when it began, all right? So, I only laid that out there to you to mess with you. Okay. <laughs> Chris. Do most philosophers accept this? Like, as so? Or is it no. Okay. Some do, the majority don't. But the reason the majority don't, I think, and I think it's evident when you read their arguments, is because the conclusion of this is therefore there is an uncaused personal creator of the universe. And like all the other quotes I've been giving you all the last few weeks, when, they, when their ideology is a naturalistic ideology, it doesn't matter how much they have to sort of lie to themselves or fool themselves or make stuff up, they're not going to accept anything that violates their naturalistic ideology. But doesn't that fit the... Uh, you, you laid out a lot of the protocols for logic. That, isn't that perfectly logical? Well, that, when, you, when you want to disagree with a, an argument of logic, and formal logic was included in one of our past classes in philosophical theology, uh, if you want to argue with logic, you never argue with a conclusion. You argue with one of the premises. And so that's why they argue with the first premise, that, that the universe um, had to begin. That, that, um, and there, if it had to begin, it had to have something that caused its beginning. All right? that's, they, so they argue with the first premise. They don't argue with the conclusion. In fact, if you're ever involved in a logical argument, don't try to, unless you can, 
The only way you can prove the conclusion is wrong, if it's a valid argument, is to prove that one of the premises are wrong. And so that's what they argue with. They argue with the premises. And the premise they usually pick on in the Calum cosmological argument is they will claim you cannot actually argue that the universe had to have a beginning. All right? Does, you, know, you can say, well, everything that has a beginning must have a cause. There must be a prime mover. Well, they argue, well, you can't prove that the universe had a beginning, even though most people be believe it does. You know, most people, even the, even the Darwinian evolutionists, would believe in the Big Bang Theory, but they will argue that that premise is not a necessary premise. All right? It is, from a philosophical point of view, this is one of the most important, the most consequential of the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. And it is based upon some science. All right? Because, again, they, they can argue all day long, and eventually... William Lane Craig can say, do you not believe the Big Bang Theory? And they go, well, yeah. He goes, then do you not believe the universe began at some point? Well, not in this case, we don't. <laughs> um, and yet that's the, that's the premise that they have the most trouble with, is the first one. So you can go home tonight, and before you go to sleep, think a lot about the, the, the irrationality of an infinite set of real things. Yes, Bruce? Um, they... Does anybody ever tie in the thing that biblically I think there is a forever before and a forever after because time itself was a creation? Right. Well, they, um, I, William Lane Craig would. He's an evangelical Christian. But he doesn't use it in arguments with people who, who aren't believers, who aren't you know, religious. Um, you know, we believe that God is infinite, that he has always existed, but that the universe was created by him and that time, as we understand it, began at that instant. And God said, time began. Let there be light. Okay. Um, and time, as we understand it, will eventually end. But we, you can't include those kind of arguments with people who are coming from an atheistic point of view. Because then they say, oh, you're just arguing religiously. We have to use science, we have to use logic, we have to be able to give an explanation for the hope that is in us, but in order to be able to give an explanation for the hope that is in us, as Peter says, we have to do so in terms that are not immediately going to just have somebody shut down. We have to be able to talk in their language, so to speak. And the point is, we can, and we can very convincingly. And that's been sort of the point of today, is for you to understand that there are some very valid complaints against Darwinian naturalism, and some very, very valid points in favor of intelligent design. And again, intelligent design, and this is one of the, this is one of the nasty things that, that, has, that the atheists have done, is they have tried to connect all arguments of intelligent design with young earth creationism. Well, those people all believe the world was only created six, seven, eight, nine thousand years ago, and it was done in four 24 hour, in seven, sorry, six 24 hour days, and that's silly. They don't believe in dinosaurs. They don't believe in, you know, well, that's not necessary. You don't have to go toward the creation science side of things to still be able to believe that there is an intelligence that we call God that did create the universe. And there's more about that we don't understand the details of than that we do. And I'm okay with that. But still you can argue for the existence of a creator intelligence, who is God. Yes, Lynn. Um, I think you mentioned, but I didn't get it. Uh, what sort of era did this Caleb cosmological argument come well, from? And was it written in Arabic? Well, yes. It, it, the original Caleb argument would have been everything was written in Arabic. In fact, the, the golden age of, of Islam, based in Baghdad, the, the House of Knowledge in Baghdad, which would have been in the 1200s. Well, no, it ended that. It would have been 1100s. Um, the point was they made an effort to gather all of the human knowledge in the world, translate it into Arabic, which they believe to be the divine language. They think God speaks Arabic. That's why the Quran is in Arabic and cannot be legitimately translated. If you have a translation of the Quran, it's considered a commentary. It's no longer really the Quran. Um, and the Golden Age really was one of the most important intellectual times in human history. Um, and great philosophy, medicine, uh, they, if it weren't for the Muslim scholars of the Middle Ages, we would have lost all of the Greek philosophy. Um, 
because Western Europe, because of the Dark Ages, and darn it, I will call them the Dark Ages, even though that's not considered politically correct. You know, people, the lights went out in Western Europe because of the barbarian invasions. Um, in Ireland and the, the East kept all of, all of the knowledge and then reintroduced all of those writings, Homer, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all of that stuff was lost to the West, but it was re retained and preserved. Some of the monks in Ireland kept a lot of that stuff, but mostly it was preserved in the Middle East. Um, in Istanbul, uh, Asia Minor, in the Middle East, um, Baghdad being the center of a lot of that. Okay? You look up the Golden Age of Islam on the internet and you'll read all about it. It's called the Golden Age. Thank you all. I'm going to give you a five minute vacation. <laughs> in five minutes early, unless somebody has any other questions. Thanks for being here. I will see you next week.